Styles change, all this stuff. I, I'm telling you, everything cyclical, eventually bell bottoms are gonna come back in style. I know, I know, that's just how it is. We drive different cars, they look different than they did years ago, right? How we, how we travel, I mean, you think about, I think it's just over 100 years ago was the first flight. And I was on a plane traveling at 500, 700 miles an hour to get halfway around the world in just a couple of hours. I mean, like half a day, we got halfway around the world. Times change and things change. Names of countries change. Myanmar, Burma, I mean, all these things change. Taiwan was Formosa way back when. All these things change. We deal with so many different changes. But one thing doesn't change is it how we live. Because all those Buddhists said we're trying to get away from this. Most people are selfish. Is that not reality? And let, let's be honest. Most of us, and I am selfish many times, aren't we? We put ourselves first. We ask the question, how does it help me? How does it affect me? That selfish attitude is one of the constants throughout time and continent. It doesn't matter what culture you're in, people are selfish. That's the one constant throughout time and everything is that we think of ourselves above everybody else. And can I tell you, it's even invaded Christianity, that selfish attitude. I don't know about you, but I, I don't know if I like it, but I think it's important to challenge ourselves with hard questions. We need to ask ourselves some hard questions. As, as selfishness has invaded Christianity, my first question is, is this what God wanted? Is this good for us? That selfishness is invaded. You know, most people, when they go to a church, you know what they ask? How can this church meet my needs? What can this church do for me? The mentality of church has changed. Another, uh, another change that's happened is, is with our attitudes, is the selfishness, is if people wonder if church should even be have missions involved in it. Can I, can I ask you a question? I want you to think about this for a second. Why do we ask, why do we even think, should church be involved in missions? You know what the root behind that is? Well, if we don't do missions, we can do more for me. I, I won't be guilty about not giving to missions. And, and I think that as we go through this, we have to be very careful about thinking what God said the church is here for and why it's here and what its purpose is. Can I tell you something really difficult? You might not like to hear this, but church is not about pleasing you. Church is not about pleasing me. Church is not about meeting my needs. It's me surrendering to Him. It's the opposite of selfishness. It's saying, it's not about me, it's about Him. It's about me saying, listen, I'm going to forsake everything else and follow Him. I'm going to forget everything else and do what He says. And can I tell you, that is the opposite of selfishness. It's saying that others are more important than me. It's saying, listen, church is important. So today I want to start a series, Should Missions Be Important to the Church? Should we focus on missions? Should it be one of our big characteristics? What do? If you've got your Bible, go to Acts chapter 1. And I'm going to explain some of this about Acts here in just a moment, but I just want to read Acts 1, verses 4 through 8. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. Now remember as you read this, I hope, it, well, if you have a red letter edition, remember the red letter is what Jesus said, right? We're going to have some red letters in here in the book of Acts. The Bible says in verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said that it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
Here's Jesus speaking to the apostles. One of the last things he talked to them about. And here's what he tells them. If you got your outline, number one, the book of Acts is about the church. The book of Acts is about the church. If you look at this, the, the actual title is Acts of the Apostles, right? We abbreviate the name uh, just to the book of Acts. But if you look in your Bible, the proper name, it's the Acts of the Apostles. It's what the Apostles did when Jesus left. Don't you think this is pretty important? After Jesus commissions them with powers and does all this, he leaves. What do they do? Because can I tell you something? The church grew exponentially at this time. This is probably the largest church growth percentage-wise in history. The church just exploded. And who did that? The apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. I believe the church started in Matthew chapter 16. I've told you that over and over, but I just want to reiterate as, as you think through this timeline. When Jesus said, uh, who do men say that I am? And, and Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, you're right. And upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I believe he was establishing his church right there with his apostles. He had his first followers. He says, I am starting the church and it, it's going to be successful. Remember who the church is. Not the building. If we follow God, Holy Spirit, we will be successful in what he's called to do. So if that's true, then the Acts of the Apostles about, is about the church starting and what the apostles did to help it grow. Okay? Matthew 16, he starts a church. Matthew 28, he tells them what they're supposed to do. Here, in just a second, we're going to see he empowers the church. But before he empowered, he told them to wait. Wait for something, right? So we've got the start of the church. We've got what they're supposed to do. Then we've got the empowering and then the book of Acts is what they did. The rest of the book of Acts is what they were doing. You get it? It's, it's the Holy Spirit leading them to show and do what they needed to do. So if you think about this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John are the story of Jesus. Right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John tell the story of Jesus, where he came from, what he did, how he died, how he rose again, and, and what he wants them to do. Then we go to the book of Acts, which is what the church was supposed to do. It, it, it's this, here's the church now formed because Jesus Christ formed it, what we're supposed to do. And, and what we find out is the apostles led the church. They were the leaders. Since the apostles were the ones that were there when Jesus started the church, and it makes sense that they would be the leaders of the church. They were there with him, right? They saw what he wanted. They were also the ones who Jesus told the purpose of the church in Matthew 20, 18 through 20. And, were, and they were there when they got the power from the Holy Spirit here in Acts 1.8. Do you catch who's there at all three of these points? The apostles. Now, I'm getting to a point with all this. I'm trying to kind of give you the history, and then we're going to talk about it. But I want you to think clearly about this. The apostles were there when Jesus founded the church. The apostles were there when, when Jesus told them what they were supposed to do. The apostles were there when he powered the church. Don't you think it's pretty simple to see the apostles as the leader of the church? And here we have the acts of the apostles. Not only that, but since they were, uh, were discipled by Jesus, the one who founded the church, they're the ones who know what he wanted. You understand why we call them disciples? Sometimes we use words and we just say them and, and they kind of lose meaning. You, you know what I'm talking about? And we just say something and we get so used to it. But the apostles, along with others, but the apostles were the disciples of Jesus. He spent lots of time teaching them. He spent time with them. He spent, he had 120 disciples, the Bible talks about. But then he had 12 disciples. He spent more time with the 12 disciples than the 120. Would you agree with me? And out of those 12 disciples, he spent more time with the three, Peter, James, and John, than the other 12. Or the, the, the entire 12. So you've got, you've got this group of disciples, you've got this group of 12, you've got this group of three, and that group, the disciples, the apostles, are who Jesus was there when he founded the church, when he told them what to do, and when he empowered them. It's very important you understand this about the apostles. Okay? So as we read the book of Acts, we find the apostles, what were they doing? They were guiding the church. They were establishing the church. When there was a dispute, what happened? 
they called the apostles back. And they talked about it. And there was a dispute about could Gentiles be saved and circumcision, all these things. What happened? Paul, all the apostles came back and they had this meeting. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You see, when the church was looking for direction, who did they look to? The apostles. And here we have this book about the acts of the apostles. When a church today needs direction, do you know where we need to look? To the apostles, to the book of Acts. Now, of course, we need to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's about how we get saved, how we know God, how we can affect people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, how he can give them peace and joy, and why that he's able to do that, because he never sinned. And yet he took our punishment. Those things are important. But when the church is looking for direction, the apostles are who we look to. If you think about it, the apostles started more churches after this, right? What happened? They didn't just stay here. They went and started churches. Since they had all the information about the church, it's important what they did in the church. Okay? So now we know they were there for everything. They were discipled by Jesus, all this stuff. So it's important what they did. They went and started more churches by winning the lost and teaching them. Is that not what Paul did? Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Elijah, they got together. They went on missions trips. And guess where those missions trips were recorded? The book of Acts. They get together and they say, okay, we need to tell more people. So Peter, Paul, all the apostles would go places and they would spend time in the, in the temple and teach them. And then after that, they would go to the, to the Gentiles and teach them and get them together. And, and they were still on special missions. Are you catching <coughs> what I'm saying here? The apostles, they, didn't, they weren't satisfied with just the church in Jerusalem. They wanted to go other places. That's what Matthew 28, 18-20 told them. Look back there in Matthew chapter 28, 18-20. We, we reference these verses often because it's what Jesus told them they were supposed to do. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. You hear what Jesus told the apostles to do? Go make disciples of all nations. How do you do that? Baptize them in the name of the Father. And the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You catch it? When Jesus was talking to the apostles here, when he told them what they were supposed to do, what are they supposed to do? Go make disciples everywhere. Guess what the apostles did? They got it, right? They went on these mission trips. Or, or, you know, the first mission trip, second, even the third mission trip. And they went to different places. They, they told people about Jesus. They accepted him. And people get saved. And they, they, they started a church there. Right? When Jesus left, they made the church stable. They went out to do that elsewhere. We call that what? Mission. They left where they were at to go somewhere else and tell us about Jesus. See, we, we, we give to missions every week, but sometimes we try and distance ourselves from the actual job. We go, but Javi and Tiffany are going to go be missionaries. And can I tell you, we're doing exactly what happened in the Bible. Javi got saved here. We've taught him. We've discipled him. And now he, like Paul and the other apostles, are going out to start a church somewhere else. Because why? That's what we're told to do. And we're trying to do what God has called us to do. Essentially, missions is winning the loss and starting a local church. This last two weeks, we were in Taiwan. And in a, in a small town outside of Tainan, which is called, hold on, Jingying. Now, David's going to call me and tell me I said it wrong. But anyway, this little town of about 90,000, little town of 90,000, and they started church there. And they got believers that meet together and they have a Chinese service, an English service. And you know what? David was sent out of another church to do what? Matthew 28, 19. Why? Because Jesus told us that's what we're supposed to do. He, he tells us that. He says, go. This is what you see in Acts and most of the New Testament. Them going to all the world. Number two this morning, the purpose of the Holy Spirit given here. The purpose of the Holy Spirit. Read verses 4 through the beginning of verse 8 again with me. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Okay, so where are that? They're at Jerusalem. Right? And Jesus, don't leave here. But wait for the promise 
of the Father, which he said, you have heard from, uh, heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you not many days. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore your kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The purpose of the Holy Spirit. They were to wait for the Holy Spirit in verses 4 and 5, right? They're supposed to wait for the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them, wait here. Isn't that odd? Are y'all like me? We don't like to wait. Anybody else like that? Like, like when you have a job, doesn't it drive you crazy to wait? When, when Melly and I, when I graduated from Bible college and we were about to move to our first uh, ministry, uh, my dad and me, we were going to, we had, we didn't have very much, but we were, we had a, a truck rented to, to go there and uh, we decided, okay, we're going to meet. I came out, I graduated like at noon or whatever. And I told him, okay, if y'all going to come help me load the truck at three o'clock, I'd appreciate it. Okay. So three o'clock. So my dad and I get up to my apartment. There's a third floor at BBC and we're sitting there waiting at three o'clock and it's like one thirty, two o'clock. And, and we go, you know, why are we just sitting here? Let's start taking some stuff down. You know, let's not just sit here and do nothing. So, okay, let's just grab a few things. We grabbed a few things, took them down. A few, we finished before anybody got there. Because we don't like to wait. Are you with me? When you've got a job, you want to go do it. We, 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 why just sit here and waste time? But can I tell you what God tells us is not always wasting time. He has a plan. And sometimes in our impatience, we don't follow the plan that he has. But God has a plan. He says, I need you to wait. Apparently, they didn't have everything needed for, that they needed for success. He's given them in Matthew 20, go to all the world, make disciples of every nation. Then he gets here and he says, but wait in Jerusalem. Don't do it yet. Why? Because they don't have everything they need. There's still one ingredient left. He's, they've been discipled. They've been taught. They, they've given what they're supposed to do. But there's something they needed, something else. You see, they didn't have the power to do what they've been called to do. You know, we like to think that we can do it ourselves. Come on, it's Father's Day, right? Men, aren't we that person? I could do it myself. I can change that starter on the car. I'm not going to pay all that money to have it done. And then halfway through, you got to call somebody, right? And go help. Right? We can do it. We can fix that hole in the wall. We can do it ourselves. But there's some things you can't do yourself. There's some things you need help for. I tell you what, here lately, and, and you know, all these different inventions, but YouTube for doing mechanic stuff, is awesome. I just a couple weeks ago, before we went on vacation, right before we went on vacation, one of the young ladies in our church said, Pastor, you said you'd help me with anything, right? I said, Absolutely. She goes, Can you change my spark plugs? Yeah, no problem. It was a force to get. It was the easiest job I've ever done spark plugs. I'd have done it in like 20 minutes. But you know what I did first? I went to YouTube. And I watched the video and it was like the easiest. The spark plugs are on top. I mean it was barely, you know. But I went and found out how to do it. Because although I have the willingness to do it, sometimes I don't have the knowledge. And sometimes we don't have the knowledge and don't have the power. We have to have everything together. Not only do we need the knowledge to know how to do a job, we have to have the strength to do the job. And sometimes we think we can do spiritual things on our own strength and it doesn't work that way. We need the spiritual strength. Think about it. Remember, the apostles couldn't cast out the demons. And they went to Jesus and they said, hey, we're trying to cast out these demons, but we can't. You remember what he told them? These are only cast out with prayer and fasting. They didn't have the power because they hadn't been in the presence of God. You get what I'm saying? God has a job for us, but we need his power to accomplish a huge job. And he told them, wait. You need to wait. Many times we try and do stuff in our own power, but it does not work. But God has the power. The apostles were the same way. 
they didn't have the power to do. We think of the apostles as these spiritual giants, don't we? But can I tell you, they're just like you, and they didn't have the power without the Holy Spirit either. And you know what they did next? <laughs> we got this great passage of, of power, but you read verse 6 and 7. Right? Remember verse 6? Therefore, when they come together, they ask him, Lord, when are you going to, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? God's got this big job for him. He's about to give them the, the, everything they need to, to complete their training, whatever you want to say it. And you know what they're asking about? God, are you, start, are you going to establish the kingdom in Israel now? Like most of us, we tend to want the questions answered that are closest to us, right? We want the questions answered that affect our lives, that, that are important to us. God, why did you do this to my family? God, why did you let this happen? We ask questions about us, and they were the same. I'm telling you guys, the apostles, just the same as us. Lord, are you going to establish the kingdom of Israel now? They were tired of being oppressed by the Romans at this time. They were tired of having somebody else tell them what to do and how to live. And so what they worried about was, was are, are you going to establish the kingdom now? You know what they wanted? They wanted the good stuff now. God, give us the good stuff. Let us rule. Let's take over the world because you're going to establish your kingdom. Let's do that now. They didn't want to wait either. They wanted everything at this time. But that wasn't God's plan, was it? That wasn't what he wanted. We ask God for the good stuff now instead of waiting, don't we? Come on. Be honest with me because I'm this way too. We're all this way. We go to God in prayer. Well, you know, we do pray for people. Joe gave me a person I need to pray for this week. We're going to put on the prayer list. And, and we have a prayer list. Every Sunday night we pray for people. And I hope you'll take one today and pray for them because prayer doesn't stop just because we don't have evening service tonight. We need to be praying for one another. But, but we ask for selfish stuff, don't we? Now, we might pray for other people, but eventually when we really get down to our prayers, it's God, here's what I want. You know what that goes back to? It's what I started talking about, right? Selfishness. Many times we go to God with our list of... I, I've told our kids and I tell other people, God meets your needs, not your needs. And a lot of our prayers are, God, here's what I want. Here's what and, and the apostles are saying, God, we want you to start your kingdom right now. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's skip all this stuff and get to the good stuff. But that's not how it works. His plan is what's best for us. So he transitions them back to what he wants them to know. Look at the beginning of verse 8. Well, read verse 7. He says, And it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Let's get back to what you need to know, Jesus says. Don't ask me those questions about what you want what the good stuff is, here's what you need to know. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. Jesus redirects them to their purpose. You see, they got off of their purpose. What did the apostles do? They established the church, governed the church, and was leading. that's the book of Acts, right? We talked about that. They were getting off of their purpose to establish churches and to, and to get disciples and make disciples that was their purpose, but they're going to... Matthew 28, here's what I want you to do. Go to all the world, make disciples of all nations. They got off that and said, but when are you going to establish your kingdom? I want your kingdom. And God's like, no, 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 that's not your purpose. He redirects them back to what their purpose was, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I need you to know where you get the power to do what I've called you to do. You need to know that you'll receive power when you listen to the Holy Spirit, when He's come upon you. Can I say the same thing to you this morning? When you live where the Holy Spirit wants you to live, you do what the Holy Spirit wants you to do, He's going to give you the power to make a difference in people's lives. We're Baptists. We don't talk about the Holy Spirit, right? But He's just as much God as Jesus or the Father. 
And He wants to be in you and guide you and give you the power to accomplish what He has, the plan for your life. But if we never listen to the Holy Spirit, we're just like the apostles. Hey, tell me when these things. No, 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 no. Here's my plan for you. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit. You need to be guided. You need to be powered by the Holy Spirit. The job that God was calling them to do was going to be hard. Our job today is not any easier than it was for the apostles. And just like the apostles needed the power from the Holy Spirit to accomplish it, you and I need the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish what God has in our life, to talk to our neighbors about Jesus, to talk to our friends about Jesus, to tell them that Jesus loves them and died for them, that He paid for every sin on the cross that they will ever commit. He paid for that sin. And He offers them forgiveness. So just ask for it and follow Him. If they will just do what they did how it was established in the Garden of Eden, put Him as God. You see, that's what we're trying to get back to, where people recognize God for who He is. We're trying to tell people that Jesus came and died as God for them to pay for their sins. That the Father had a plan so that they could be with Him for eternity. That the Holy Spirit wants to give them the power to live and to have joy and peace in their life. And you see, what we're trying to do is get back to make God, the God in our lives. You can do that if you listen to the Holy Spirit and do what He says. Because He has the power for you to do that. Listen, I don't want to, they're going to sing a song in Timber, they were practicing this morning. I don't want to leave a legacy. I only want people to remember Jesus. That's the song they were singing this morning. I was like, wow. I don't want people to remember me. Because if they remember me, they got nothing. But if they know Jesus, they have everything. And the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to tell people who Jesus is. Just like He did with the apostles. That power that we need, he, it's directed through the Holy Spirit. He gives us the power to obey. Because I don't want to obey most of my time to you. I want to be selfish. But the Holy Spirit teaches me how to obey. He gives us the words to say in those times when we don't know what to say. The Bible says, listen... When you go before the magistrates and kings and you don't know what to say, just listen to the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you what to say. How many of us worry about what we're going to say if we witness? Hey, prayer, fasting, in God's Word, He'll give you the words to say. We worry about the things that the Holy Spirit will do for us. He gives us the plan that God has for our lives. Can I tell you something? Everybody in here has a different plan for their life. Don't expect somebody to live like you or go where you go or te reach the people you want to reach. God didn't call them to do that. He called you to do that. He has a different plan for everybody in here. And guess who reveals that plan to our life? The Holy Spirit. But we ignore the Holy Spirit. We don't listen and we wonder why we're ineffective Christians. We don't listen to the Holy Spirit. You see, you need to be led by the Holy Spirit. If you get outside of His leadership, you won't accomplish anything for God in your life. But the Holy Spirit will guide you. Listen to this, what He says. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He told the apostles, when the Holy Spirit is on you, you have power. Do you believe after salvation the Holy Spirit lives in your life? Then you know what you have? You have power. Not to be wealthy and not to be healthy, but to live for Jesus. To affect other people. To help them find who Jesus is. That's what the power is there for. To, to, to lead other people to Jesus. Number three this morning, what are we powered for? Powered for what? Okay, listen. As we've gone through this... You did, the book of Acts is about the church, right? And, and, the, and then he reveals in this verse 8 that we're supposed to be powered by the Holy Spirit, right? So powered for what's the next question? What are we powered for? And we've alluded as we've talked about this. Look at the second part of verse 8. And ye shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and, Sam and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, put this whole verse together. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. Guess what the Holy Spirit's powering us to do? Be witnesses for Jesus. To tell people about Him. 
to be witnesses where they were. Check this out. Remember, we talked about this in the earlier verses. Where are they at right now? Say that loud. Where are they at? Okay, let's go back and read. Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from... Okay, everybody say it. Where are they at? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So they're sitting in Jerusalem. God's talked to them. He says, when the, stay here until the Holy Spirit comes. So they're in Jerusalem as the Holy Spirit comes to them and comes upon them, right? We right there? And then read this, second part of verse 8. And you shall be witness to me in... Right where you're at. You know, a lot of our excuses that we use for people is, well, I, I can witness to other people. I, I, well, send me somewhere else. Well, when I go there, I'll do something for God. I tell people, if you're not useful where you're at, how can God use you somewhere else? If you're not being effective where you're at, how can he use you somewhere? So Jesus tells him the first place you need to be effective is in Jerusalem, where you're at right now. God wanted them to be witnesses of him. God can't use you somewhere else if he can't use you where you're at now. He wants to use you right now. The best way to be used with God is to listen to the Holy Spirit where you are now and obey him where you're at right now. Verse 4 tells us that they were in Jerusalem, like we talked about. The first place they were to be witnesses is where they were at. God wants us to be effective where we're at right now. And can I tell you something? The power came to the apostles through the Holy Spirit, and you told me you have the same Holy Spirit in your life. So you know where you're supposed to be witnesses for? You know where you're supposed to be witnesses at first? Right here. Right where you're at. In your neighborhood for your next door neighbors, for your friends, the people you work with, the people you go to school with. You see, we're supposed to witness everywhere. They were supposed to take the message everywhere. Did you catch what it says? Jerusalem, and then all Judea, the general region around Jerusalem, and in Samaria, listen to me, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. That's why the story of the Good Samaritan was such an impactful story to them at that time. They hate each other. And Jesus said, hey, you're supposed to be witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, and you're even supposed to go to Samaria, the place you don't want to go. The place that you'll avoid at all costs. They would walk miles around not to go through Samaria. And yet, that's in our list of where the Holy Spirit was going to empower them to be witnesses. And then what does he say? And to the end of the earth. To everywhere around the world. He's speaking directly to the apostles. I think he's speaking to us too. But he's telling the apostles, listen, you're supposed to take the gospel. Is that not what Matthew 20, 18 through 20 said? Make disciples of every nation. You see, we get this story repeated to the apostles over and over again. Jesus kept telling the same thing. Listen, you're supposed to do this to me where you're at and everywhere around the world. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit for power. Listen to me, guys. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and you are supposed to be witnesses to Him where you're at and around the world. The message of salvation is not for the few, it's for everybody. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's supposed to be to the ends of the earth. It's not supposed to be right here. God has given us the power of the Holy Spirit to win souls everywhere. But that leads us to another question. Can you go everywhere? You can. Javi and Tiffany are leaving our Jerusalem to go to Scotland to win people there. Now, you have a part in that. You help disciple them. You know their kids, Grace and Sora. You know you've invested in them. That's why we invest in each other. You support them financially to take the gospel. You have a part in that. So you are accomplishing what God called the apostles to do in this church today. He told make disciples everywhere. We are accomplishing that, but you can't go to Scotland. I mean, you can go visit. I just visited Taiwan, but I can't stay there. I've got to win here where I'm at. How can we go everywhere? 
How could the apostles reach everywhere? You see what they did? They decided they'd go establish churches. Hey, I got an idea. It's the Holy Spirit. But let's listen to him and go start churches. So that's what they did. What happened after they went to places and told people about Jesus? Read the book of Acts. They went to all these Iconium and, and, and all these different places. And they would win people, get them together. Said, it's amazing. What happened? People believed in Jesus. Churches were established. And those churches reached out to other areas. That's why we have church here today. Because the gospel spread out from there and it kept spreading until it got... Hold on. Check this out just for a second this morning. Understand this. The apostles were supposed to take the gospel to Jerusalem first and then around the world. Where are we meeting today? On the other side of the world. How did they do it? Did any apostle ever come to America? To Texas? To Houston? No. Not one of them came here. You know how they did it? They started other churches who reach other areas and those churches reach other areas. And that's how we do missions today. Our missionaries go and start local churches where they're at, train people. And then those churches send other people. In our fellowship now, our missionaries that we established 20, 30, 40 years ago, those countries are now sending missionaries to other countries. And you know what they're going to go do? When people start churches, now those churches reach out to other people. You see, it's working. And there's proof of it because Cypress Creek Baptist Church is in, in Cypress, Texas right now. It's not in Jerusalem. God's plan was working through the Holy Spirit power in them to do. And what did they do? They went and started churches. That's what they did. Paul went and one people gathered together and started a church. Where was that? That's why we have the books of Romans through 2 Thessalonians. Right? The book of Romans was a, a letter to the church at Rome. 1 and 2 Corinthians was a letter to the church at Corinth. Ephesians, Ephesus, Galatia, uh, Galatians to the church in Galatia. You see, the apostles did this. They went and started churches. And, and then we got these letters back to them, and they were correcting stuff and telling them what to do, but they were guiding them. These were all places they told, that they went and told people about Jesus and started churches. The power was to be witnesses everywhere. Then once they did that, they talked to, uh, and these talk to Jesus and were discipled, they would start churches. So they'd go out, win people, disciple them, they would start a church there. You know what that's called? Missions. It blows my mind that anyone in God's church would not be sold out on missions if you read the book. You know why this church is here in Cyprus? Missions. Because they started a church somewhere, which 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 came across the Atlantic and they started a church in America, which started a church somewhere else, and eventually those, the starting of churches moved to our area. Are, are, are you understanding when Jesus was talking about the church? Matthew 28. Go into all the world, make disciples of every nation. Um, the point of the church missions. Acts 1.8 But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Guess what he's talking to the church about doing? Missions. The New Testament is letters to the different churches that have been started out of the church of Jerusalem. You know what that's called? Missions. You see, we, we miss it. The Holy Spirit has given us the power to follow God. He gives us the power to be witnesses and to follow a plan that He has. <coughs> See, God is concerned with people finding salvation and then being taught in a church. That's what the apostles, after they spent all this time with Jesus, after He discipled them, after He told them a plan, after He empowered them, that's what they decided to do was go start churches. They decided to do missions. But we missed the point of missions. We think missions is in Africa or Asia. But did you catch what Jesus told them every time? Start where you're at 
and my people of Jesus. They were in Jerusalem. He said, first, you go to Jerusalem. We can't travel around the world. We can't be everywhere at once. But through the Holy Spirit, we can. We can send the Javis and Tiffany's to Scotland. You know, that was the first couple sent directly out of our church. Now, we've had some other missionaries that have gone to our church and, you know, and, and stuff and other areas of the world. But that was the first couple that got saved here. Both of them were here and left our church, our assembly, to go somewhere else. You know what that's called? Missions. Without missions, the church has no purpose. That was what Jesus told him to do. In every statement of empowering or planning, he said, take the gospel everywhere. It's like trying to play a game of basketball without a hoop or a ball. What's the purpose of basketball? To make that ball go through that hoop. Well, we're going to play basketball, but we're not going to have a hoop and we're not going to have a ball. Church is about missions. Mission starts next door, across the street, at your job, Jerusalem, Cyprus. And it goes everywhere else. We take the word missions and we think of a person going to Africa, to Asia, but that's not missions. Missions is taking the gospel next door. Missions is taking the gospel around the world. Missions is starting churches. We come back to our question. The question of this series that we were about, should missions be important to church? Missions is the purpose of the church. Missions is the point of all this. Yeah, we are supposed to evangelize and edify. We're supposed to build each other up and, and learn more and be discipled in who Jesus is and how he wants us to live and all those things. But even that discipleship should be about missions how to tell somebody else about Jesus. I hope as we look at the story, as we, as we study God's word in the book of Acts, that we see that the missions isn't something we do. Missions is who we are. It's the vital point. It's the only thing God kept emphasizing to the apostles. Take the gospel somewhere else. Win people where you're at. Go somewhere else. Listen, is should missions be important to the church? Man, missions is everything. Everything about the church. It's our purpose. It's the plan. It's everything. Next week we have a special missions offering. I did not preach a sermon. I had this plan before we did this. I didn't preach a sermon to help that missions offering. But I'm telling you this. That's what's important to church. Missions. I hope next missions conference, y'all are raring to go. That we realize that that missions conference is the purpose of church. It's not a side thing we do. It's the purpose. And I hope as we go through this series that God gets a hold of your life. And I'm planning another missions trip in 2020. And I hope you'll be part of it. Because when you go and see, it changes your perspective. It changes everything. Should missions be important to the church? My answer is an emphatic yes. Let's pray. God, as we look at your word, and as we as a church try and figure out what, what we're called to do, help us understand what, what our purpose is. God, what's your plan? That we would be led by the Holy Spirit to have the part in that plan that you call us to. God, help us not to be selfish with the gospel and only worry about what, what we get out of it. But we look to get rid of that selfishness by listening to your Holy Spirit and do whatever you call us to do. God, we know you'll provide for us if we're obeying you. So God, I pray that you would work in our hearts and our lives to give everything over to you. Lord, not that you're going to ask us to give everything, but sometimes you just want us to be willing. Lord, help us to, to see the mission 
to see the purpose and to follow the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand for verse of invitation. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I pray that this is your prayer and this is your calling and that God would lead you. Listen to the Holy Spirit and follow him. And let's sing this together. Take a joy than being obedient to God. Uh, I know Brother Bill came up signing this. If you haven't taken this pledge, we the people of Cypress Creek Baptist Church pledge to be committed to God, to people, to our marriages, and to our church. If you haven't signed that pledge and you want to, it's going to be up here. But we want to be committed to God and committed to His purpose in our church. And I pray that our church will. Let's close in a word of prayer and ask God to do it. Uh, to, to lead us this week. Brother Overmark, could you close some prayer?